Well, hello everyone and welcome to this first lecture of the series on smell. So in this first lecture, I'm going to talk about some very basic things. The first thing is, what are smells? Well, smells are molecules. And you can ask, well, what's a molecule? And in answer to that, I will give you the answer that the famous physicist Richard Feynman gave when he was um, asked if you had to take one piece of knowledge, one piece of information away, uh, if the world was going to be destroyed, and there was one thing you wanted to keep to pass on to the next uh, people, what would it be? And Richard Feynman said, the world is made of atoms. And smells are made of atoms. But not just any atoms, they're made of mostly, almost 99%, certainly the ones that you would be allowed to smell in a perfume or in any flavor, for example. They are made of atoms that come from one particular part of the periodic table, specifically the northeastern uh, part, which uh, contains all the elements that life is made of. So in the periodic table of the elements, you will find that most things around us are made of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. All the other uh, elements are, of course, present uh, on Earth in small quantities. Some of them are made by physicists, but mostly the chemists use those elements, and it's very rare to have anything, particularly any um, synthetic uh, uh, molecule that smells, that contains another um, element than those. Many drugs, many um, medicines contain elements from the right hand further right to in the periodic table, the chlorine, the fluorine, sometimes the bromine. There was, in fact, one perfumery uh, material that contained bromine a few years ago, but it was discontinued because it was considered unsafe. It smelled great. I smelt it. It was quite wonderful, but in the end they um, discontinued. It was made by a German company. So, what does it mean molecules are made from these elements. Well, the atoms of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur can make connections to each other. So you can stick them together um, like, a, like a game. You can, you can actually build molecules by sticking those atoms together. And they have different uh, properties. The carbon can stick to four different atoms, the nitrogen to three, and oxygen and sulfur to two, and hydrogen over on the left only to one. So when you put them together you can make a, practically an infinity of, of molecules. Only some of them will actually have a smell. And this is a very uh, important and interesting question. What uh, properties of a molecule give it a smell. So, for example, the gases that we breathe, um, nitrogen, which is N2, it has two nitrogens together, and oxygen, O2, have no smell. Same <clears throat> structure, they have two atoms, they're the same element, they have no smell. So, the question, the first question one would like to ask is, what is the smallest molecule that has a smell? And that's an interesting question because there are several uh, contenders. There's um, nitrous oxide, which has a faint smell. It's used in anesthesia. There's ozone, which has a very strong smell. It's not good for you. You shouldn't breathe ozone. That stuff will damage your lungs. And then there's the famous hydrogen sulfide, H2S, which also has a smell and is very powerful and smells 
of rotten eggs. Now, the funny thing is that everything that has S and H attached to each other smells of rotten eggs. There are two things about that that are interesting. One is that this fact that everything has an S, that has an S and H attached to each other smells of rotten eggs will turn out to be a very important fact in understanding how smell works. And the other thing is, I don't know, at least where I live, of anybody who's actually smelt a rotten egg. I think rotten eggs disappeared from markets and from supermarkets a long time ago, but everybody still calls uh, that smell of rotten eggs, even though they've never uh, smelt them. So that's the smallest odorants would be, let's say, what are called triatomic. So ozone, H2S, um, N2O, so ozone, hydrogen sulfide, and uh, nitrous oxide. Now, what is the biggest molecule that has a smell? That's a very interesting question because um, it really, you would expect that, first of all, things would stop smelling when they stop evaporating. And we'll come back to that in a later uh, lecture. But that's actually not the case. The, the, the fact is that there is a limit, an upper limit to size of a molecule that has a smell. And it appears to be 16 carbons. So almost regardless of the exact configuration of the molecule, you can imagine there would be tens of thousands, if not millions of molecules that contain 16 carbons that can be arranged differently. But the fact is, if they contain more than 16 carbons, you will not smell them. And that is a very strange and interesting fact. So for example, if I make a ring of carbons, and I put an oxygen attached to one of the carbons. The effect of putting an oxygen gives it a stronger smell. Typically, things that are made of only carbons and hydrogens have rather weak smells. There are some exceptions. But if I make a ring and I start with, a, say, a 12-membered ring, then I do a 13-membered ring, then I do a 14-membered ring, then a 15, then a 16, then a 17, and 18, you'll find that the 12, the 13, and the 14 smell woody. They smell like um, cedar wood. The 15 and 16 smell like musk, and that's a smell which is um, very important in perfumery, and we'll come back to what kind of smell that is. The 17 smells not very pleasant. It smells sort of waxy, like uh, when you... Uh, snuff out a candle with your fingers and you get a, a rather waxy, harsh smell. And the 18 carbon smells like nothing at all. And 19, 20, and 21 is the same. And that seems to be true for basically essentially any uh, molecule that built beyond 16 carbons, they have no smell. So at the small end, we have very light gases like um, the ones I've mentioned, H2S, N2O, and so on. And at the high end, we have essentially only musks. There are some other molecules in musks that have 16 carbons, but mostly it's musks. So it is an interesting, interesting thing that in between these two limits, you have all of the known odorants. And many of them have around, I don't know, I suppose 10 carbons or uh, 12 carbons sometimes, or six carbons. The majority. I don't think anybody's ever done a statistic of what is the number of carbons in the majority of odorants, but let's say 10 carbons would be a good average. And then as you go up, you reduce both the type of smell that they have and ultimately the intensity. And when you get to 16, you have nothing. So the second thing that we would like to know about smells is what makes something a particular substance smelly and another one essentially odorless and the answer is basically does it evaporate for 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 something to have a smell the molecules have to leave 
the object fly through the air and get into your nose. And many things don't uh, actually uh, fly through the air. For example, if you take a, a glass full of, or a spoonful of oil, let's say, and you compare it to a spoonful of alcohol, the oil, if you leave them both on the table, the oil will still be there a week or two weeks later. In fact, it'll be there probably a year later. It may have changed chemically, but it will not have evaporated. Whereas with the alcohol, it'll be gone within hours. And the difference between the two is that alcohol is volatile. It mean, that means it flies through the air. And let's say the molecules, the 16 carbon molecules, actually they're more than that, uh, molecules of uh, oil do not. Okay, so in order to demonstrate to you remotely, you can do this at home with your own perfume that you have on hand. It has to be a mixture. It can't be a pure material, otherwise this won't work. So this is uh, Monsieur Balmain, which was an absolutely wonderful uh, fragrance composed by a great perfumer called Germaine Cellier, who's famous in the history of perfumery because she did about half a dozen of the greatest perfumes of her time in the, between the late 40s and the mid 60s. And Monsieur Balmain was um, uh, perhaps not the most famous one she did, but at any rate, to men, because it's supposed to be for men, Monsieur means man, gentleman. Um, it was a very important fragrance and it was reformulated a few years ago um, and a friend of mine, Calice Becker, was the perfumer who reformulated it and it was very interesting because she, she took the, she was actually given the original formula which is most unusual and um, she looked at it and it turned out it had, once she, she spent weeks uh, basically figuring out what was in it because it was made of bases, meaning already made compositions, which themselves contained dozens of things. And sometimes one of the things would be a base, which also contained dozens, dozens of, of, of materials. And in the, in the end, she found that the sum total of everything that was in Monsieur Balmain, the original, was um, something like 1,100 different materials, which is pretty crazy. And she was given the opportunity to simplify it as much as she could. And I think she ended up with about 38 materials. And when you smell this, you basically, what you see is, what you, what you perceive immediately is that it's very fresh up top and very lemony, but underneath you know that there's something else at this degree of, of sweetness and heaviness. And so the, the, what are called the top notes are the molecules that I was talking about, which evaporate faster. So they hit your nose at a higher concentration at the beginning of a fragrance. And then there's the heart notes, slightly arbitrary. Nobody really knows where one ends and the other one begins. The heart notes are, in a sense, where the main idea of a fragrance is expressed. And then the dry down notes are the ones that are left when everything else is gone. And dry downs can be on occasion, very memorable and interesting. But um, as I explained, as you go up in size, you get fewer and fewer smells. So that dry downs tend, not always, but they tend to be more um, alike each other, less diverse, less interesting, less inventive than either the top notes or the heart. So now when I smell this, I can, I'm beginning to smell the lemon is going away and I'm beginning to smell something else in there which I recognize 
There's a bit of lavender and then there's sandalwood. Sandalwood is a very important uh, material in perfumery. And then below that you can smell the sweetness of a material called labdanum, which is again a bigger molecule. And if I put it down on the table and I bend it like this before doing that so the perfume doesn't touch the table, then I come back to it half an hour later. It'll mostly be dry down materials. It'll mostly be uh, musks and that sort of uh, compound musks or woods or woody ambers, typically the, the heavier materials. Now, while I'm on the subject, let me tell you about smelling strips. Smelling strips uh, are very important to evaluate any smell, whether it's a single material uh, for aromatherapy or a complex perfume composition. Um, I particularly love this type of smelling strip, which is quite stiff and has a, it has a groove down one side, so you can actually, you can bend it this way if you wish. Sometimes that's useful if you want to insert it in a bottle that has a small opening. And of course you can bend it this way if you want to rest it on the table. Now these smelling strips happen to come from a French company called Santis, which I think makes the world's best uh, smelling strips, so I'm very happy to give them some free advertising here. Um, they're also great because they're quite stiff and thick, so that if you take the smelling strip, let me, if, if you take a smelling strip and touch it to an open um, bottle, sometimes you have to do that because there's no spray and you can't get the thing in, so you just have to tilt the bottle to get some of the perfume on the strip. The great thing is you can hold the smelling strip against the bottle and tilt it and it will not have touched your finger because it's quite thick. Anyway, these are small things, but for the perfume uh, lover, they make a difference. So this is a demonstration. Now let me go back to Monsieur Balmain. And now the lemon, all the citrus has almost disappeared and what you smell are aldehydes and sandalwood and some labdanum. So already we're shifting down. You'll come back tomorrow. Um, maybe by tomorrow it'll all be musks and labdanum.